Welcome everybody. Uh, today I'm talking with Tim Robertson, an amazing athlete and orienteer from New Zealand, living currently in Sweden with some spectacular results, especially from sprint races uh, um, during different world championships, European championships, uh, the world games uh, competitions. So I'm thrilled to be exploring this area with Tim. We have had an opportunity to chat a little bit before that regarding his beginnings in orienteering, regarding orienteering in New Zealand, regarding his um, his, his his transfer, so, so to say, from New Zealand to Europe and focusing on uh, different areas of both sports and studies. And this part will be available on our Patreonite, but now we are going to be focusing more on his sprint races, sprint results, sprint career, and uh, orienteering challenges that were connected with those wonderful results that he was able to achieve. Welcome, Tim, to the channel. Um, all right, so let's begin with, like, let, let's take it chronologically. So the earliest awesome result that I noted is 2018 sprint during World Orienteering Champs where uh, you were second right after Daniel Hubman, and it was a very close call. Uh, do you remember this race? Do, yeah, I'm sure yeah, you can... do. This was like your first medal, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can probably go back to Riga and rerun the course without the map. Yeah, I, I suppose yeah. so. Um, how, how do you remember it? Like, was it an easy win? Was the struggle? And uh, how much time and preparation did you have to put into this race to achieve the medal position? And I know that, like, we've known each other for a little bit longer than 2018. We've known each other earlier. And I know that you were already on a very high level, at least as a physical runner. I even have some results from your career on my phone. And for example, you were able to run the three kilometers, 8.13, eight minutes, mm -hmm. 13 seconds, right? So this is like a physical level that I think puts you in a brackets of contesting all the medal positions already. And you were finally able to get it to 2000, in 2018. So how do you remember this race? And was there something interesting, something uh, different about this year that allowed you to reach for the medal, medals compared to previous years that you had? The, it's, it's funny you bring up the running times because I was involved in um, athletics in mainly cross-country running uh, before I started with orienteering. Yeah. And Running had been uh, one of my strong points as an orienteer within New Zealand. But what I'd noticed when I moved to Europe and started racing against the senior orienteers was that I was actually one of the slower runners in the start field. So as a junior, I was running just under nine minutes for 3K, around 8.50, I think, were my personal bests as a mm -hmm. junior, which was fast enough to compete for the medals there. But... Definitely not fast enough to even be within the top um, 20 or top 15 as a senior. And I would really notice in my results that I could have great splits for half of the course, but would, would fade towards the end. Right. So either my running speed would be lacking and I would just lose time to the to the best in the world uh, to, in, in the second half of the course, or mm -hmm. I would make a big mistake in the second half of the course because I was just too tired and my endurance yeah. wasn't there so i i kind of looked at the my, my previous results and where i was losing time to the best and made a decision at the start of 2018 that i was going to work a lot on my physical running shape and at the same time i had this theory where if i got too fast at running then and didn't learn how to read the map at the same speed then there was no point and getting faster at running so i went a bit crazy in 2018 doing both physical training and probably triple the amount of orienteering training than i that i had done in previous years wow i can remember the last month leading up to uh, the world champs in riga i somebody has written down how many orienteering trainings i did within that period but it, it was almost one per day 
uh, in the final month leading up to Riga. So I would say I was quite well technically prepared and because I had worked so hard on my physical shape over the winter, I was quite well physically prepared as mm -hmm. well. It was a shame that I didn't run any time trials during this period to see what sort of pace I was around. But yeah, that's given that it was such a fast course, I, I think I must have been close to uh, my best over 3,000 during this period. Cool. Um, so do you like, did you keep it as a pattern for the following years as well? Like you thought, okay, this worked. I need to keep repeating this and I'm going to be getting those amazing results. Yeah, I I made a lot of sacrifices that year and it was not sustainable. So I think that was what I noticed after getting the medal. Um, it was a great feeling and standing on the podium was um, incredible, but I wasn't so happy with the way that I had gone about um, getting that result and felt like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to be able to continue this for the rest of my elite career. I need to find another way to enjoy the training that I'm doing. Yeah. So I, I toned things back a little bit after that and did a lot less uh, technical training and tried to find a better routine within my physical training that was sustainable. And uh, how, how do you feel about it now? Do you feel like you've found this balance that you were looking for? I think I've found it now. I had some injury struggles in uh, 2021 um, and I'm injured at the moment, <laughs> but the the periods in between where I'm able to train well, I'm, I'm happy with my balance between not just the orienteering and professional side of things there with sport, but cool. the rest of life. <laughs> and I'll, yeah, that, that's very important. Another thing that I'm wondering about, like theoretically, you went through a period of very intensive technical training, right? Before uh, the, the Riga World Championships. And it elevates you to, let's say, a new level. You know, mm -hmm. is it fair to say that? I think so. Yeah. Right. So, I think that, like, after you reach this level, you kind of understand what is needed to be at this level, and from that point on, you don't need as much technical training to maintain this level. Am I close? Yeah, I, to the I think so. I feel like that effort that I put in there has stayed with me. I don't need to, I just need to do sprint orienteering races occasionally to get back to that level rather than go through a month of intensive sprint training every yeah, single exactly. day to get to that level. That's what it feels like when I'm, you know, I've been um, lucky enough to talk with very, a lot of very good runners over here. And it seems like it's, it's a pattern that early years, they train really a lot with the map because they need mm -hmm. to raise their orienteering technique. But at some point when they feel like they understand what's going on, uh, they don't have to do as much technical training as before. And I specifically remember right now a chat with Gustav Bergman, uh, mm -hmm. and I was talking with him and he, he was saying that during, for example, during his winter months, even though he lives in an area where it's usually possible to run in the forest if he would want to, he's not actually doing a lot of technical training because yeah. it, he feels like it's not necessary anymore. He just needs to yeah. work on his shape and therefore he can afford to spend a little bit less of time in terms of hours, really, right? Doing the training itself because we all know that technical trainings are the, the most time-consuming, really. Uh, or more time consuming than standard physical training, so to say, right? Because e even uh, sing singularly for the fact that you actually need to travel somewhere to run on the map, right? And if you just want to do a physical training, sometimes you just need to leave home and go for a run, depending on where you live, of course. Yeah. Uh, so, so that seems consistent across all of the people that I've been talking about. And another interesting thing is uh, I think it, it nicely connects with uh, I, I've been listening some time ago to a podcast from um, Huberman. What's his name? I, I'm not sure if it's, maybe it's Daniel, maybe not. Uh, anyway, uh, Huber, Huberman Lab. Mm. It's, it's a podcast from the guy that is a neuroscientist and he's uh, 
doing an amazing work around educating people of different facts of neuroscience. And I remember this one podcast I was listening to uh, early this year in Portugal about the learning process and how the brain learns. And it wasn't about orienteering. It was about playing the guitar, really. The example was there. But the, the analogy is there, I think, still. And the process looks like this. You try and try and try and try to play the song the way that it's supposed to play. And your brain is registering the fact whether your attempt was successful or not. And if you keep trying and you keep being persistent and finally it clicks and you hear the right sounds, the right accords, and you know they are clean and uh, the way you imagined, and you feel you get this feeling that this was this is what I was aiming for, suddenly the brain erases all the previous attempts and remembers only this one successful one so but then it's easier to repeat it so if you are able to do a difficult thing one time successfully it becomes so much easier to repeat it again so I, I, and i think it's the same with orienteering if you like get this amazing race where you feel the flow and everything clicks and you're making few mistakes and you're in full control I think that after the race, you kind of get this feeling, hey, orienteering is not that difficult. I understand it now. And, and of course, it's a little bit misleading because it is still difficult, but you got to a place and your brain remembers how it felt like and what you had to do to get there. And it's, it will be easier next time to get into this similar state of orienteering technique, let's say. I can definitely agree with that for the sprint orienteering. I haven't um, reached that point in forest orienteering, but it seems for, for others, like there is that barrier as well. I'm just cool. still searching for it. Cool. So moving on, uh, 2021, you've been third again on World Orienteering Champs uh, during, uh, uh, during the sprint as well. What do you remember about this race? I think especially like the terrain was very interesting. And I, I said earlier that I will definitely ask about any kind of special preparations that you were doing to run on a, on a stronghold, stronghold located there. Yeah, that was a really special race. Um, just the, the fact that it was such a unique terrain, I think, played into my favor because I was injured that year and had, had a really bad um, build up uh, coming into it and knew that I wasn't in the best physical shape to compete against the fastest sprint tiers in the world. Yeah. But uh, luckily the, the course there, I think played into my favor and it was a tr tricky in a unique way. Not, not like a old town in Italy, but this multi-level and um, just things didn't look how you were expecting. You might look at the map and at first glance and assume that it's going to be a 10 meter wall going down, but in reality, it's a 10 meter wall going up. Uh, there were a lot of different levels within this um, stronghold, like you said. So that was cool. And maybe coming from a place like New Zealand, where we are expecting the unexpected when we go out sprint orienteering, there's always, I don't know, a new construction zone or a small problem with the map, even in high level competitions, it can happen. So we're, we're quite, quite prepared, I feel like, uh, from growing up with orienteering in New Zealand for unique terrains, unique mm -hmm. areas. Okay. Did you do any kind of special training for, for this? Solving, uh, not I not know, really. I, I spent quite a bit of time looking over the area, uh, obviously. Google Maps these days allows you to get yeah. a pretty good idea of how the town looks. Um, we had an old map, so that was released to everyone, which went, now it was a pretty good old map. You could see uh, almost all of the areas that they used. They opened up a few new tunnels that weren't on the old map, but on the whole, you could get, you could get a good overview of what to expect. Um, one thing we did do because they brought in the new uh, sprint standards for mapping and all yeah. of the tunnels and walls looked a lot different on the competition map to how they did on the old map. That's true. Yeah. So one thing that we worked through was um, changing the old map into the new standard so that we were at least looking at 
how the race map was going to look rather than um, studying and studying this old map and the old symbols. So I think that was quite a big help. It wasn't cool. that I flipped over the map and went, oh, everything looks different to what I've been preparing for. Yeah. Um, I was prepared for this new symbol set. Sure. But it sounds like you didn't do anything extraordinary, really. No. Um, there's a, <laughs> it's a funny part of sprint orienteering. I, I don't like to do it, but at the same time, I'm competitive in these days to be competitive in sprint orienteering. A large part of it comes down to how well prepared you are for the terrain that you're running in. Yeah. Because you, you know that the big nations have an OCAD file of the area that they've spent um, mapping on Street View. Um, you know that they've had people setting courses, they've run courses on Street View. Um, there are, there'll be videos of the town on YouTube that they've been looking through. Uh, and for me, with the, the little resources that we have within New Zealand orienteering, a lot of this sort of stuff I have to do myself, and it is time consuming to be as well prepared as the big nations are for competitions like this. That's true, yeah. So I, I try to do what I think is necessary to have an okay result, but not to go into it too e extreme, because you can get stuck in it. You can spend your whole day uh, looking at maps and of old areas before a world championships. That's definitely true. Um, let's see. Um, 2022, last year, first place sprint in the World Games in USA. Um, how, how would you compare the World Games to the World Orienteering Champs in terms of difficulty? It's a really interesting event. So held every four years, like the Olympic Games. Um, it's it's funny, I've been to two of them now, one in Poland and one now in the United States. Mm -hmm. And for some nations, it seems to be just as important as world champs. And for other nations, it's ranked below even World Cups. That's the kind of feeling that you get when you go to that competition. And then I think it also comes down to the, the organizers as well. Orienteering is not really big in the United States, but it is quite big in Poland, uh, if, if you compare the two anyway. So I thought yes. that the, the competitions were, were great at both, um, in both countries, but that the Polish um, organizers were a lot better prepared for a high level competition. We, I think we just had the World Cup there. Uh, we ran on similar maps and yeah. it, it felt like a world champs level organized event. Whereas um, the World Games, a lot of the American World Games organizers didn't know what orienteering was, and we were more of a showcase sport there. In some of the, I'd say the forest areas were not typical, really challenging forest areas that you'd see at a World Championships event. But on the other hand, the the sprint map was great. It was a university campus, um, really technical, quite similar to terrains that I've grown up on back home in New Zealand. So I felt right at home running on that map. It was like going back to New Zealand and running a race there. Nice. And uh, do, do you feel like you were simply in very good shape and that's why you were able to win? Or because, as you said, some of the countries didn't really take it as seriously as other countries, the um, list of competitors was not as strong as it could have been? I think if everybody who's there are at least running the competitions as hard as they can. So um, I'm sure winning, that, yes. winning gold there was uh, definitely one of my best achievements in my orienteering career. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, so too. But there are only two runners from each nation. So if you compare that to a European champs where there are, is it eight, I think you can send. Um, mm -hmm. that, that can be quite a big difference. Uh, and I think there there was a little bit less mental preparation going on behind the scenes before that race. But I was in good shape. This was uh, about a month after World Champs in Denmark that mm -hmm. didn't go so well in the individual for me. Um, and a week later, I had run a personal best in 5K, so I knew I was in good shape. And it was a, it was a bit of revenge after a bad World Championships for me to 
get gold at the World Games. Yeah. And your result from 5K? Um, 1354. Yeah. 1354, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, <laughs> more, more like gentlemen. <laughs> this is more or less the level you have to get to physically to be able to compete with the best, at least on sprint, right? At least on sprint. Yeah, um, it's getting quite crazy. Yeah. I want I want to get into 2022 races as well, but before I go there, there is one thing that like I, f I feel like I have to ask. So, 2018, I'm thinking about Daniel Hubman. So he's he's still competing. He he recently announced that he's still going to be competing next year, which is amazing, yeah. I think, and. Um, it's like well-known fact that during the, the older years, let's call it like this, in, in the elite class at least, your body is not fast enough anymore to be at the, at the level that will allow you to compete during those shorter distances, right? So Daniel is, I mean, his season this year wasn't amazing. Uh, it, it was still very decent, right? He was comfortably placing within top 10 almost all the time um maybe with, with a few exceptions but he will definitely be struggling more in sprints than the forest races right even though his technical abilities definitely allow him to do very well on both do you think that it is possible to have a great sprint result without being at the physical shape that you are in for example without you know getting close to your best times i think it's definitely possible but it depends entirely on the terrain and the the course setting so n next year I, I could see daniel getting a medal at the world champs in scotland mm -hmm. because it's it's steep there are staircases there are tight alleyways um if the courses are set well it's going to be very, very technical sprint orienteering and technical running. And that's where Daniel is one of the best in the world. Yeah. But if you compare to um, Italy, more recent races where there was a lot of running, it was pancake flat. Um, I think the percentage that he is behind the winner is the percentage that he is behind in a athletics race at the moment. In a track race, yeah. And I think he knows that too. And I, I saw that in some of his analysis afterwards that uh, yeah, he's, he, he will just be waiting for a race to go back in a terrain that suits him. And I think he'll be straight back up to the top of the results list when that happens. Well, we will see. Like, I'm, I'm always cheering for him. He's close to my age. I would have to check, but I think he's very close to my age. So, you know, if, if he's able to do a medal results during uh, his early 40s, on World Championship. Wow. Yeah, pretty impressive. Wait a moment, I need to check this. He's 83, so he's one year younger than me, right? So yeah, he will be 41 next year, I will be 42. Yeah, that will be impressive. Um, all right, so let's talk a bit about uh, the races in Denmark, right? Last year, 2022. And let's start with the knockout sprint. Um, yeah, so this is the final of the knockout sprint. And I know you've been doing really well and choosing your own route choices during this knockout sprint for um, a long time. But in the end, you were not able to get to the medal position. How did that happen from your perspective? Yeah, it was a pretty crazy race. I was happy just to make it to the final uh -huh. um, with such strong competition. Uh, it just sort of happened on its own. Like I didn't plan to run away by myself like I did. But I have this um, general plan when I'm running knockout sprints that if the group does something that I wouldn't do if I was running an, in an individual race, that I trust myself yeah. and I go by myself. And that just sort of happened directly from the first control. And often in sprint orienteering, when you come in from a certain direction, it makes sense to exit in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. And I think because we split at the first control, 
it just sort of continued like that all the way until the arena passage that we were splitting. So it was quite fun. Um, I didn't expect to be totally alone already in the first minute of running. <laughs> it's quite a unique experience turning out onto this road by myself and being like, oh, okay, world champs, knockout sprint final. I'm alone. <laughs> so. But you still you still knew that you're doing a good race, right? You you saw them from time to time and you you knew I that could, you were ahead. I could see on the map that the route to the first control was 50-50 and knew that we would come together and yeah, I just sort of in, enjoyed my little moment by myself. And then yeah, um, when I saw the guys come and punch the first control together with me, I was like, okay, now the racing starts again. So you want to play this and yep, yeah, get sure. through the race? And if you have like some moments you want to pause and comment, feel free yeah. to do that. Yeah. So here's the moment where we sp split up. And then we, we split again to the second control. Um, that was just like what I talked about where it made sense for them not to turn around and come back. Um, and it made sense for me just to do a 90 degree turn and pass through this uh, passage here. Mm -hmm. But this was the first major split where I thought, okay, now I can win a little bit of time. So me and August Malin uh, turned around from Control 2 and ran mm -hmm. um, back to the south. It was quite a cool feeling coming into number three and seeing them come towards us and know that we were going to get to the control before them. Yeah. And but at the same time, it's, uh, yeah, okay. it's early days in a knockout sprint race and one and a half seconds or two seconds doesn't mean anything at Control 3. <laughs> That's true. So then we came in through the arena. I think I was just in front here, but the pace wasn't too high. Um, here we were all taking the same route choices. So I was leading the group, but we were just uh, cruising a little bit until number nine, which if you've listened to the commentary, I think they're talking about some explosion of speed suddenly happening. And that was... Yeah always going to be the case it's the last uh route choice league there are how many options three is, three different is it like options? part of the tactics that you're running with the group and you're deliberately slowing down in yeah like two-thirds yeah. of the race to get yourself a little bit more comfort in terms of reading the route choices for the last one or two controls i think so for sure um that's, that, that's, that's what i would do as well yeah yeah, con controls like number eight, I really like being in the front because you can do this sort of rubber band effect where you, you slow down going into the control, punch and turn really quickly and sprint off. And the person who's punching the, the eighth control in last position is 25 to 30 meters behind coming out of the control, even mm -hmm. though they were at the eighth control at the same time as you. Yeah. So it's quite quite special tactics in a knockout race. Um, the other thing that was quite special in this race, and I think Matthias does it too, is um, flipping the map at points of the course where it's easy. We had a map flip at, at the run through here before number six. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do it and I think Matthias does it, but uh, flip the map. I, I think I did it on the way to number one once I came through this passage. I knew from running the quarterfinal about this road here. So I knew how to get to the first control without reading the map anymore. Yeah. So I turned my map over here while running on memory to look at the last leg of the course. Right. Because nine times out of 10, it's going to come down to the last leg of the course. And that was my first look of, oh, okay, it's quite a tricky last leg. I can't see a great option. And by then I was almost at the first control. So the map got flipped back over and I ran to the second control. Mm -hmm. But it's quite a strange feeling to be running world champs on memory while preparing the last leg of the course. Um, yeah. Probably wouldn't suggest it to everyone to try that, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Matthias is doing this as well. And then at the end, um, I made a split second decision to go right. Same with Yon Jonathan. Um, Kibbutz made a split second decision to go left, and left was the better choice, and there wasn't much I could do. Yeah. 
that's what it comes down to in knockout. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about the knockout knockout sprint in general? I saw that there was a lot of discussion actually this year, um, yeah. and not only this year about you know it's a new format, so it's for for me it's kind of obvious that it will um, spark some controversies, and there will be people with better ideas how to do it. How do you feel about this type of sprint orienteering in general? I still haven't quite decided where I where I sit on the whole knockout sprint argument. I think they're they're so much fun to race. Um, for a lot of people, they're really fun to watch, especially non orienteers. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a lot more understandable. The first to cross the line is the winner. Yeah. Um, the fastest two make it into the final. It's a simple com concept for people to understand. And you can see in real time um, route choices and how orienteering works. Yeah. And I think it makes it easier to understand individual orienteering after you've watched a knockout because we're doing the same thing as a knockout, but individually. And if you understand the concept after watching a knockout, it can be easier to understand the individual side. But at the same time, I also think it's so hard to make it fair and that seems to be an argument that gets brought up quite a lot that um there's a lot of following involved because mm -hmm. there has to be uh and then the the different types of forking that are used open it up for different um yeah just different problems to come about basically <laughs> with the, the the fairness side so it's a tricky one I find it more of a showcase event to showcase orienteering for the awesome sport that it is rather than something that should be at our world champs. But I don't know. I'm still making up my mind on how I feel about it. Yeah, it kind of feels like if, especially, you know, if there isn't enough working and uh, the, the, the runners are not supposed to pick their variants before the race which happened as well right that was really an interesting twist to um to knockout sprints you know if you can you can grab a person that is really good at running 3k yeah. put him in a group and just tell him okay follow this guy and beat him at the last 100 meters yeah and most likely he will be able to do that right yeah yeah what i really yeah. liked with the courses in denmark where they at least allowed the opportunity for us to split up. Yeah, that's what I was going to and say as well, that this course was quite good in terms yeah. of route choices. And this, as you said, decisive last leg to number 10 was yeah. really well thought. Yeah, but oh, that's a must. If if you just have a running race to the end, then we may as well not be doing orienteering. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So but it, I thought doesn't, they did a great like, job. You, you kind of lost courses. this, but you feel like, okay, I lost it because others did better orienteering than me and yeah, it doesn't feel yeah. that bad yeah and if i had have gone left to 10 i think matthias and august malin would have both passed me mm -hmm. because they were stronger physically but i probably would have um stayed ahead of jonathan and then it would have been a medal which would be a, a great success for the championships for me yeah um yeah, I think it's funny too if you or we should also look at other sports and they've been creating new disciplines like this as well, like cross country skiing and their knockout format. And it's not the same people that are winning a cross country skiing knockout race to the ones that are winning the 50 kilometer classic. And the the other thought that I've been having when this new discipline has come about and all of the controversy around it is maybe it doesn't need to be the same people that are winning. Like, why why should it be the same runners? Uh, it, it's just a new discipline. Yeah, exactly. So if there's a good runner who has some map contact along the way, but sprints passed in the last 200 meters, they've still had to um, get through an individual qualification, a quarterfinal, a semifinal, and a final. Yeah. So... It's not like you can take a non orienteer and they can get to a world champs final just because yeah, the, the person would have to get very lucky, right? Several yeah. times in a row. Yeah. 
to be able to do that. So Which is not impossible, that, but that it's a new breed of orienteer that will win the knockout sprint. Yeah. So you know, I, I'm I definitely I'm definitely not feeling that this is a bad idea. No. I just feel like it's a it's it's an idea that has a lot of promise. We just need to work on making it as good as possible. And you're you're studying business, so you know implement test improve implement test improve right and eventually yeah. we will get there um yeah. or not you know it might happen that the idea was flawed from the beginning and there is no way of fixing it but it doesn't feel like that to me it feels like yeah. there is place for this we just I need to make sure that it works all right so we know that this year your physical form for physical shape was decent and you were definitely able to reach for the top spots and uh still during the the individual race something went wrong and i know what went, went wrong but please go ahead and, and and show it to others you can again um do the full screen mode f11 yeah. to have more place on the screen uh so uh show us what went wrong and an even in, more interesting question to me always is why? Why do you think it happened? Yeah, I think the mistake itself is quite easy to see, but the why is maybe the easiest to begin with. And you can't really see that, that on the GPS, but uh -huh. coming into the first control or even the start triangle, there was a lot of direction changes. So we turn left here, 90 degrees, right here, 90 degrees, 90 again on the bridge, mm -hmm. and then 90 again in here past the small tree. And I had started quite quickly, uh, just sprinting off without a real plan. And all of these direction changes uh, put me behind on the map. And I had a small mistake coming into the first control and was stressed because of that. And then the, the mistake itself happened um, with my plan to number two, which I had seen this, this route through here, which I think was the shortest. Uh, and then coming through here somewhere, if I remember correct, exactly through here. Mm -hmm. But um, after coming out of this control, because I was so stressed about where the first control even was, um, instead of running down here, I was coming out of this car park and running through to this gap and through to this gap and through here. Mm -hmm. And so in my head, turning to the right after coming out onto the main street and going through the first alleyway I see would have brought me into this courtyard. But in reality, I came out and went through this gap and ran, as you can see, into this dead end courtyard. Yeah. And it, it might not look like much on the GPS, but that's effectively the, the race over already there. That's true for the sprint races, unfortunately. So it's like, uh, what, what would you do better if you were to, to run it again? I think there wasn't much I could do on this day. Um, I wasn't in the right headspace for running a final. I'd had a good qualification in the morning and mm -hmm. the, the orienteering there was a little bit more simple. But the, for me, the knockout day had really taken its toll. Um, I'd run probably close to 35 kilometers that day, in, including all of the warming up and cooling down for each of yeah. these races. And I'd run the sprint relay a couple of days before that. And then the qualification in the morning and this race was just one too many. So I've had a lot of uh, thoughts on this race afterwards and basically come to the conclusion that if the program is the same, at the next world championships or European championships that I will skip the knockout um, just to focus on the individual race. And there were a number of athletes that did that. Uh, Yannick, for example. Yeah, Yannick Mikos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That, that was In the conclusion that I came to. Interesting conclusion. But, much. you know, fr from what you're saying, it does make sense, you know, because running so many fast-paced races one after another, really, in a very short succession, has to take its toll right there's no other way and mm. i was kind of um, i was kind of thinking that maybe you will say 
maybe I should have started a little bit slower because the terrain was a little bit tricky and I should have slowed down to make sure that I read the map properly. But at the same time, I do realize that if you're aiming for the very top result, it's not really an option, is it? Yeah, yeah. I'd say you're, you're right. Maybe in this in this case, it was a really tricky start and it would have made sense in hindsight to have slowed down a bit. But I, I still wonder if I was fresh this day, whether I could have gone at the speed that I had started at. Exactly. Right? And it's, because, it's hard you know, to say. It's a little bit tricky, but it's not super tricky. No, uh, no. So I feel like in your top shape, you still, and clear head, you should still be able to handle this. I think so. Yeah. It was no trickier than the some of the controls in the knockout races. Quite a big route choice to number two, but it wasn't that I hadn't identified the shortest route. Exactly, you know, right? You, you found execution. it. You just didn't execute it. Mm. Interesting. All right. Um, what are your plans for the upcoming years in orienteering? Well, at the moment I'm injured. I've had a pretty horrible long-term injury since March. So I'm getting surgery uh, in a week and a half's time on my knee. I have a meniscus injury there. Mm -hmm. So fingers crossed with that going well, um, I'll be back for the early World Cups next season. And it's a sprint year next year. So it's obviously nice for me. <laughs> yes. And I'll be putting an effort into being in the best shape possible for the world champs in Scotland. Right. Uh, I definitely hope that, you know, the surgery goes well and you're able to get back on the horse and into the full shape because it's always a pleasure to uh, watch you run and enjoy the orienteering. Um, before we end the discussion for today, the last thing that I want to ask, or maybe two last things, are um, I, I remember that last time we were talking and like doing an interview eight years ago, we were talking about forest races as well. And you said that one of the goals and uh, of, of moving kind of to Europe is also to get better at forest orienteering and try to get to a level where you will be able to compete with the best in the forest as well. But this didn't happen, right? Is it, is it okay for me yeah. to say that? This didn't happen, yeah, right? It's okay. Like yeah. uh, from, from the results perspective, that's, you know, I've, I've always been cheering for you, but uh, the results... Uh, improved uh, uh, of course they did right but getting into like top six top ten is still not uh, something that you can easily achieve mm. why do you think that's the case now, i've been thinking a lot about that recently too and one of my plans for this season before the injury was to uh, try to get better in the forest um so I think one one of my problems is that even after moving here, I've done more forest orienteering than I did when I was in New Zealand, but I haven't done, I haven't focused on it. I haven't done a full preparation for a World Cup or a World Champs like I do for sprint orienteering. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say I still haven't tried yet properly to be a forest orienteer, <laughs> which gives me a little bit of hope that I... Yeah could do it one day but on the other hand when you see the level of the orienteers and the age that they started and the their technical abilities i'm not sure if i'll ever get to that level but i'd like to try before i uh, quit my elite career okay i will definitely be rooting for you <laughs> and it, it helps now to live in this area because i've got some beautiful maps around me i'm um, sure it does very very heavy scandinavian terrain and no excuse really to not give it a go. That's true, that's true. All right, um, last question that uh, I usually ask uh, to the people that I'm talking with is, what do you think is the most, is like if you're supposed to pick one, what is the most important skill for an orienteer to have? Oh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I think to be really open-minded, and you can spread that over all areas of orienteering. 
um, when you're competing to be open-minded, but also w within your training and uh, ev everyday life, basically. So to yeah, just listen to um, how other people are doing things, or if you're looking at a more competition perspective, uh, just to be open for anything to happen during an orienteering race. Yeah, so it's it's also as as far as I understand, it's it's not only about the race and be open minded and react to what's happening live during the race itself, but also be open minded as uh, don't live in a bubble and to listen to other people's yeah. ideas and don't be afraid to experiment a little bit and try to improve yeah. through experimenting, because yeah. uh, like for me, everybody's a little bit different, right? And just because something works for someone else doesn't mean it will work for you. So it's good to try different things and see what actually gives you the best results. Yeah, that's one of the beauties with orienteering too, is it allows people to reach a high level through all different types of uh, training methods. And and yeah, their, their route to the top can be totally different. So, exactly, yeah, cool. exactly. I definitely agree with that. All right, thank you very much for the chat today. It was wonderful to get, into, to get together again and uh, spend some time talking about orienteering maybe we'll see each other in in a month or two uh talking about more sprint oriented uh topics but i'll i'll leave it open for your consideration and discussion and if anybody is still watching at this point in time in this video and you want to see team uh teaching a few interesting things regarding the sprint techniques let us know in the comments Cool. Thank you for having me. Thank you.